Uh, greetings, my name is Adam Draycott and you're watching the online ministry from Inverell Anglican Church. Uh, this has been prepared for the 6th of August 2023. We're going to begin our time by reflecting on a sentence of scripture from Psalm 121. Uh, it's talking about the Lord. He says, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep such as the providence of God. We're going to see that play out in our preaching passage from Acts 27 in a moment. But for now, let's pause and let's have a time of praise. pray. Lord Jesus Christ, be merciful to your people. Fill us with your gifts and make us always eager to serve you in faith, 
hope and love. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. As we come to the ministry of God's Word, our Bible readings come from Psalm 121. And our preaching passage will be from Acts chapter 27 right through to chapter 28, ending at verse 10. Uh, But if you're looking for Bible readings, if you're in church, uh, Acts 27 verses 1 to 4, and then 13 to 26, uh, Acts 27 verses 39, right through to verse 10 of chapter 28. Uh, If that's confusing, uh, find the bulletin that you received as part of the email bundle. Let me pray. Loving Father, we ask that you'd help us to use this time well, that you'd speak to our hearts by your Spirit, you'd grow us in Christ Jesus, that we glorify you. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. In his name, Amen. Christmas holidays in my childhood meant a week at the lake house on Tuggera Lake, such was the generosity of a a family friend. Uh, The entrance is on the central coast, and that's where the big boat shed is. And one time, Dad took uh, my little sisters, I think it was, and I, out for a spot of fishing. But he decided this time we're going to get a rowboat. And you know how the story goes, maybe. You row out onto the lake, you catch nothing, And then Dad tries to row back, which is in the channel, in the entrance. And the current was just way, way too strong for him. Uh, (laughs) And now imagine all the fishermen uh, on the wall uh, looking, and they're happy with their choice, aren't they? And we, we needed to be rescued. It was really awesome. Okay, maybe not so much. Uh... That memory burned into my mind uh, that, you know, pay extra, uh, get one with a motor. And so one day I did. I'm an adult and I've hired a half cabin boat at Foster. And Tanya was seven months pregnant with Thomas and Sophie's, she's about three. And I thought it was a great idea, didn't I? And um, yeah, the current is savage. And you know when you head out and you, it's so fast, even with a motor, you're wondering how you're going to get back. And that frightening, you know when you drive, ever been out of control in a car and it's really frightening, even for a moment? Well, this was a constant state of that kind of fear uh, in the boat. We're trying to avoid oyster leases uh, and it's not your boat. And man, we got a really close up close look at those pylons. They're like telegraph poles, aren't they? And uh, it turns out they're really solid, by the way. And the child screamed. The fun was over and land couldn't come soon enough for me and the family. Why am I telling you this story? Because it's traumatic when we're not in charge and when we don't feel like we're in control, isn't it? When life is like that. As we open Acts chapter 27 and a little bit of chapter 28, it is good for us to ask, who is in charge? This all looks traumatic and out of control. So who's in charge? Verse 1, it says, When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. Julius the Centurion... Any relation to Tom Julius? I don't know. Ask him. But why is it that when we meet a centurion in the Bible, there's always lots of goodwill? They're portrayed as men of integrity most of the time. Why is that? I don't know. Um, Notice Julius is in charge. Verse 3, he decides what is allowed, so kindness to Paul. Verse 6, he's he's found an Alexandrian ship, so that's a cargo ship, from Egypt. Later, we're told in verse 37, it holds 276 people, 
which is not uncommon. Um, apparently, these things were good for 70 tonnes of wheat. I understand a big semi hauls about 40 tonnes. Is that right? Anyway, I'll find out on Sunday. Someone will tell me. Verse 11. He decides, this is Julius, uh, verse 11. What does he decide? The centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Uh, Okay, but then verse 12, since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix, and on it goes. So you see that Julius is in charge, but he's a collegial leader. He brings people with him, so we, we like him. As a prisoner, though, you wouldn't expect Paul to have much of a say, but there it is in verse 10, and Paul basically says... This is going to be a disaster. Now, why is he saying that? Did Paul get an, an epiphany at this stage? No. He's talking from his extensive traveling experience. So, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, Paul says, Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. He's got experience. Everyone should also know that its shipping season is about done, that winter's coming, that they're on the fringe of the seasons. And so, well, what are they doing out there if it's such a bad idea? The, the winds are not their friend. Every time they pass this thing called a lee, that just means they're looking for the sheltered side of uh, the bay or the, uh, the island. And so why are they so persistent and determined? One, it's a cargo ship. They're privateers, and like any truckie, they got to get the haul in, right? Uh, second reason, Caesar. History records Emperor Claudius taking all possible steps to import grain. He would even ensure merchants against loss of their ships in stormy seas. Such is the need. A million people lived in Rome, the capital of the world. They need food for winter. That's what's going on. Now, if the weather wants to have its say, though, it doesn't matter who's in charge, whether your name is Julius or even Caesar. And so the storm rises. Let's pick it up at verse 15. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it, and we were driven along. And so watch this unravel, verse 16. Um, they can't make the lifeboat secure, so it's hoisted on board. Verse 17, they pass ropes under the ship to hold it together. That's Apparently that's called frapping. Who knew? Uh, binding the parts of the ship. Um, you're feeling confident right now? I'm not. Uh, no life jackets, by the way. Verse 17, they're afraid. Verse 18, the cargo is tossed. Verse 19, the tackle is tossed. Verse 21, they go some time without food. Verse 20, read it. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. That sounds depressing, doesn't it? They gave up. This is absolutely hopeless. It's another reminder, isn't it? It's really traumatic when we're not in charge and we're not in control. This is a picture of that. Application, stress, danger, catastrophe, opposition are all part and parcel of life. We all face the pressure of living in a fallen world. A fallen environment, we live in it. And Christians are not exempt. Creation is subject to frustration. We see that here. And as we live in the world, we are frustrated, but God never is. So do you trust him in a crisis, in whatever crisis you're going through? Do you know that God is on his throne and he will still have his way and that nothing will frustrate his purposes. Notice now in the story, Paul is going to grab the mic, so to speak. Um, 
They didn't listen to him before, but now they're going to listen to him. So there's development. And there are three interventions. So come with me. In verses 21 to 26, there's the call. Don't be afraid. Keep your courage. I mean, he's urgent. He's inspiring. Why? He has reasons. Verse 22. I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Oh, great. <laughs> Last night, an angel of the, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and, and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Don't be afraid. Keep your courage. God keeps his promises. The ship will be lost, but none of you will be. Paul is steadfast. And what is the key to his steadfastness? Verse 25, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Did you hear that? It will happen. God said. Application. How's your faith? Is it like that? Do we have faith that God's promises happen just as he told me? The promise of forgiveness, just as he told me. Wrath turned aside, just as the Lord told me. The work of the Spirit in my heart, just as he told me. That all things work for the good of those who love him according to his good will and purpose, just as he told me. That the world, in this world, you will have trouble, but I've overcome the world, just as he told me. Or the resurrection to eternal life. Do you believe it? Just as he told you. They're questions about faith, aren't they? Faith in God's promises. Here's another question. In the Bible, the most often repeated command from God is what? What's the answer? The most often repeated command from God is, do not be afraid. Paul heard this uh, when he was in Cor Corinth, Acts 18, verse 9, before the Sanhedrin, uh, Acts 23, verse 11. And now he hears it here in verse 24. And each time, there's a great personal need that Paul has. It's timely. It's gracious. Even Paul needed encouragement from the Lord. So see, in his darkest days, God sees his need and God meets his need. Do you know that about God? In your crisis, you name your crisis. Do, do you know that the Lord is with you? He is there to comfort you and assure you. Application. Don't be afraid. The Lord is trustworthy. He is good for it. He is good for anything. All right, that was the first intervention. Here's the next one, verses 27 to 32. And it's pretty... Pretty straightforward, stick together is the message. Don't be afraid. The first one, this one, stick together. Verse 30, the sailors want to jump ship into the lifeboat. Verse 31, Paul says, no way, stick together. And so the centurion and the soldiers, they listen and they cut the ropes and the lifeboat drifts away. Because when God graciously promises to save the lives of all, he means all. Application, don't jump ship. <laughs> don't think you can bail out. You, what, you got somewhere better? Is there a better option? Are you serious? No. Take courage, Christian. Stick together. Stay together, people. Here's the third intervention. And I wonder, what's the third intervention? Is it eat something? Uh, oh, I hope so. Verse 33 uh, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat, because that's what you do when a storm is raging, right? Uh, for the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and you've gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. I'm thinking there's no shortage of water, though, right? Uh, now, I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. Ah, who does that sound like? 
This is Jesus in Luke 21, verse 18. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. And then he broke it and he began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Things are going pear-shaped. I expect that to read when they had eaten as much as was spare, not as as much as they wanted. But again, I want to ask, is your memory triggered? You might be going, oh, Jesus calmed the storm. Is that what we're meant to see? Well, Luke chapter 8. What is, happens in Luke chapter 9, though? Jesus calms the storm, Luke chapter 8. Master, master, we're going to drown. He stills the chaos. Okay, you've got that. But Luke chapter 9, he feeds a crowd. And okay, not thousands, but it is a very hungry crowd here. It's 276 people on board a boat. Verse 37 tells us. Application. We can trust the Saviour, no matter the storm, no matter the crisis. It is the Lord who provides. It's the Lord who who knows our needs, even the physical needs. And so we give thanks to him in every circumstance. This is what Paul does. He returns thanks to God and see him say grace in front of a boatload of pagans. Uh, it's so good. Brothers and sisters, take courage. Stick together. Trust and give thanks to the Saviour in everything, even when it's all out of control and going pear-shaped. There is a discipline. I mean, even verse 39, they decide to run the ship aground, and even that doesn't go right. They land on Malta. There's a snake bite that Paul experiences, and the islanders are like, no one can have so much bad luck. He must have murdered someone. And so their worldview is a bit like karma, retribution of the gods, payback. But of course, Paul survives, which somehow then makes him a god, according to them, which is really fickle and you're like you know who is in charge of this mess it's one thing after another what is going on this is diabolical but what would paul say the paul would say the lord the lord is in charge the lord is providence now sidebar for just for a quick moment i want us to see that paul's trust in god and and paul's godliness doesn't stop him seeing the danger of sailing with the onset of winter coming on. Uh, or that the crew needed to eat to survive. Or that wood, something like wood, needed to be collected to keep the fire going. Okay, what am I trying to say? If we're all about wisdom and less about faith, pride and sufficiency will loom. But if we're trying to be so spiritual that we jettison all wisdom, then we might be forgetting that God gave us a brain and he wants us to use it. So we've got to do both and balance both. So see the encouragement that Paul is a man of God, right? A resilient faith, but he's also a man of action. A man of the spirit, yes but also a practical man, a man of common sense, and we're to apply both. I want us to see that. Here's the next thing. Do you see the providence of God in these chapters? All through Acts, Christians are chased, hunted, interrogated, uh, put on trial. Paul is stoned, Stephen is martyred, and now it's like creation itself rises up and we get the storm and then we get the snake. Each Incident seems to be designed to make this impossible. And as we read this, and as we see how impossible it is, don't we, are we struck by how much detail there is? Uh, we know Luke loves attention to detail, but why? There is so much space here given to this event. If we stood in the shoes of a Jewish reader, what would they be thinking? Well, how would their memory be triggered? What would they make of the sea? The sea is reminiscent of 
primeval chaos. A violent, untamable force. And in the Old Testament, it is a regular symbol of evil powers in opposition to God. Isaiah 57 verse 20 is an example. So there you've got the sea, but then you've got the snake. And I say snake, and you say run. No, that's not the answer. I say snake, and you say the devil, don't you? Enemy number one. Opposition to the gospel. Opposition to God and his good purposes is wicked and ultimately it's of the devil. Humans can plot and threaten and scheme. We can see this watery chaos and we can see the snake. And we know behind all of this is the one who through scripture persistently attempts to thwart the purpose of, purposes of God at every turn. The machinations of the devil, the wily devil. I mean, Rome is the capital of the world. No way can the gospel go there. Humanly speaking, impossible. But God will have his way. And of course, Paul is fine. And, and where does the snake end up? Yeah, in the fire, which is pretty cool, I reckon. Yeah, 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 you got it. Now, when Jesus promises Paul that he'll testify in Rome, we know from the beginning it's a done deal. It is a done deal that nothing will thwart God's purposes. So we must see God, his determination to save. We must see that this is a salvation story. That the word salvation actually in this section, it's hard to see, but in the original language it pops up uh, at least seven times. Seven times the word for saved is used. And now we know salvation's come to us in Christ. In Christ Jesus on that cross and his death and resurrection, we are saved. So how do we cope in the chaos, friend? Where do we look in times of crisis? Who can be trusted when life falls apart? And then sometimes our stand for Christ, our gospel witness even then adds to our suffering. Brothers and sisters, don't be afraid. God has this. Don't be afraid. Stick together. And trust the promises of the Saviour who loves you and return thanks to him. Do we believe God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will? Do we believe just as he said? Do we believe the Lord who declares no wisdom, insight or plan can succeed against the Lord? Do we believe the Lord just as he said? That's faith, isn't it? Friends, nothing can frustrate the purposes of God. Don't jump ship. Stick with him. Don't be afraid. Let us stick together. And let us trust the Saviour. Let's cast our eyes to him and return thanks to him for all of his blessings. Amen. sins and griefs to i
trouble anywhere We should never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in prayer Can we find a friend so Brothers and sisters, I encourage you now to uh, pause this video and spend some time in prayer. On the screen are some bullet points to help us um, and to direct our prayers. I commend that to you. strength to cast at fears no other name 
close with these words from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the ship may he equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.